In episode 14, we will examine the cosmic blast scale, from things we can grasp to the largest booms in the universe. But first, we're going to examine a piece of terrestrial evidence of the global earthquake, or perhaps better described as the Great Vibration. This is Douglas Vogt of the Diehold Foundation, and one of his most intriguing pieces of evidence includes this lava field flash solidified in mid-cymatic standing wave. The simple version is the earthquake was so grand and unified that entire plates vibrated and one of the ongoing lava flows was dancing in the vibration, followed by a wave of ocean that cooled it into place. Now liquid lava could absolutely dance in such a scenario, as you see many places online with other liquids and vibration, including Billy's Plasma Lab. The mainstream science issue is that such a vibration would require an earthquake unlike anything ever known a globally resounding effect. The catastrophism side of this is that the lava field actually exists, and while one could ask where others on Earth like this are, one must admit it's almost amazing this has not been eroded or covered by foliage. It is actually sort of unreal looking of a scene, but imagination won't suffice to explain it. Now let's get to some energy scales. We have to begin with the erg because it's the commonly used unit for cosmic blasts, and one erg is equal to the power of approximately 600 billion electrons. Sounds like a big number, but many more can be found in your pinky finger. In fact, more than a million ergs are involved in one single heartbeat. This can be expressed as 10 to the 6th power, and so now for comparison, the Japan earthquake released about 10 to the 24 ergs of energy. When you raise the exponent, it's a world bigger, sometimes worlds bigger. So let's take this to the cosmic scale, and I'm going working from top and bottom in towards the middle for a good reason. First up top, the hypothetical Big Bang has an estimated release of 10 to the 75 ergs, but in reality, even if it does exist, total energy of the universe should be conserved, so it's actually zero ergs. Down at the bottom, surely nano flares on the sun could drop to extremely low numbers, but for flaring relative to space weather purposes, you can pretty much go up to 10 to the 32 ergs, which is about the maximum estimate for the Carrington event in 1859, the greatest flare in recorded history. Back to the top, the so-called hypernova and supernova, the blasts which signify the end of the star. Those energies can be phenomenal, with the difference between hypothesized types of supernova resulting in that enormous difference in energies released. Now we're going down to orange. The regular nova, or shell-like ejection which does not destroy the star, but would likely obliterate the planets or at least sterilize them were they to be found around them. The 11 known recurrent nova, 10 in the Milky Way and 1 in Andromeda, fall into this category. There is almost certainly no life around those stars. However, just as there is a super flare class above normal cycle solar flaring, there should be a class of nova that does not destroy the planet. It does not sterilize it, or even prevent the advanced life forms on those planets from communicating their experiences over time in voice and rock. These two categories, the micronova and the super flare, are where the energy levels blatantly overlap. This is because of the low level of the shell release which is possible, it may only involve sparse ejecta, or which may only include electricity and not so many larger chunks. Even though a super flare still comes from only one sunspot, it could still release as much magnetic energy as the star could pour into it, and evidence suggests that other stars' super flares can be as big as a small micronova and beyond. The question of super flares on the sun is not as popular as other solar research topics, but it is by no means untouched. In fact, a great surge of these works began immediately following the return of lunar samples from Apollo. When the focus turned expressly to the sun, like sun-like stars, it became readily apparent that X1 million flares occurred on sun-like stars and that X100 to X500 flares occur on sun-like stars spinning as slowly as ours does. This leads to numerous studies confirming the potential for super flares on the sun on relatively short time scales, much shorter than the 12,000 year cycle described by many catastrophist researchers, with something a hundred times the Carrington event or stronger potentially coming every millennium. If true, this implies the sun can go even bigger on multi-millennial time scales and more recent works have begun to stray from the pure dynamo model and confirm that idea, seeking to focus on a more superficial and externally interactive model of solar magnetism, including with electric sheets near and often above the surface, 
and with more recent work on cycle termination observations, it is becoming abundantly clear that not only do we need these new models of solar magnetism, but that the magnetic energy of the sun is far greater than any model currently considers. That same force is what makes superflares on the sun a very real physics risk, and when they occur, the main question is whether or not they are aimed at Earth or they are aimed away. This is different than the micronova, which would blast out in every direction. And in terms of a trigger, anything from the unknown to a simple rotational jerk from a galactic event could shed the corona from centrifugal force. Imagine you're carrying soup into a quick 360 spin. Out goes the soup in every direction, if not the spoon, bowl, and tray as well. There is indeed an enormous amount of evidence to suggest that the micronova happens, or at least a tremendous super flare. And there is evidence that it is not only survivable, but survivable to the point where the survivors can tell the stories again, in voice and in rock. Much more coming on those survivors and ways we might survive and a number of other topics in the coming episodes. Be safe, everyone.